retreat center a good count and kind of know what to expect this year. Many of you probably are fans of crime dramas or thrillers, or that genre of movie or series. And if you watch those series, you know the kind of characters that show up. There's sometimes the obvious good guy, the obvious bad guy. Uh, sometimes the person, there's the person that is almost too good through the whole time, and then at the end you realize, oh, they're the one who did it. Or there's the person who shows up with all the unnecessary drama, like, you know, there's a nuclear threat, and here comes the ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend who wants to have a define the relationship talk, and it's like, we don't need this right now. We're trying to save the world. There are a couple of kinds of characters you may be used to seeing, too. You probably are familiar with someone who plays the role of the fixer. And the fixer is the one who you call when trouble's coming and you don't want to deal with it. So when someone's threatening you with blackmail or there's a, a threat on someone's life, there's a, a scandal to be dealt with, you call the fixer. And the fixer goes out ahead and the fixer handles the problem before the problem ever reaches the main character or the hero. And you've seen this if you watch shows like Breaking Bad or you watch Scandal or Pulp Fiction, any of those shows, you have seen these people at work. Another role that you might see, kind of related, is the cleaner. And the cleaner comes in after the hero has done the work, and maybe it's the bad guy that's done the work, and just makes sure that no one finds out. So there are bodies on the floor, we've handled it, there's a mess, the police have got a whiff of this, and before they get there, the cleaner's going to come and handle the scene, handle the problem, so that the main character can be the hero and just move on, and no one ever has to deal with anything else. You've seen those characters before? I suspect that the people living in the city of Jerusalem in the 580s BC were hoping that one of those two characters would show up. They're walled in in the city, and the army of Babylonia is at the gates, threatening to come in. They've besieged the city for the final time. Now, they've been coming in over the previous decade and setting some fires and causing trouble and carrying some people off into exile. But now, in 587, the real moment has come. The army's at the gates. They're ready to come in and ransack the city. And the people of God inside are scared. Now, they're in this situation because of their own disobedience. They've been given plenty of warning that this could happen. And here it is. And what they'd really love is for God to swoop down as the fixer. Maybe like he did when God's people were rushing away from Egypt. And just handle the army and don't bother the people in Jerusalem. Just come down, fix this. We don't want to have to deal with it. Or they might be hoping for God the cleaner. So they could do all the hard work, defeat the Babylonian army, look victorious and heroic, and God just comes and handles things afterwards. But the humans get all the credit. They might have been wanting one of those two things. I want you to meet me in Psalm 46 in a moment. And in this psalm, we're going to see some steady words from a psalmist who seems to be reflecting on this event, but maybe others and he writes some specific words about what's happened here, but he writes some timeless words that help steady us. And so in this psalm, we see that God is not going to show up as a fixer, and God's not going to show up as a cleaner, but we read about God the something else. Join me in Psalm 46. The, the superscript, the heading for this psalm, says that it's for the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamot. What that probably means is the sons of Korah were like a traveling musician group. Alamot is just the word for young women. So probably this was written uh, to be performed by a traveling group of musicians, maybe written by them, maybe performed by some young women, or maybe they're the audience for this. So there's some rooted specific uh, authors and audiences in mind here and yet we find ourselves as an important audience for this psalm as well the psalm begins this way 
God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. There are three really important words just in this first verse describing God. God is a refuge. A refuge is really, as it gets used, kind of a high place up in the mountains. In fact, there are verses that talk about it's where the rock badgers would go to find safety. Same word. Many times in the Psalms and in other places, God is referred to as a refuge. Isaiah uses this word to talk about God as the shelter from the storm. Maybe calling to mind Bob Dylan's song. Many Psalms claim refuge in the Lord. And usually when this shows up, it's accompanied by a request for protection. So be my rock of refuge is language you might know. Refuge is a place removed and protected. Then it says God is our strength. As we know, strength can be good or bad. Power can be helpful or corrupting. So it's really important. What kind of strength does God have? Is it the strength that only just creates fear and throws weight and authority around? Or is it the strength that gives us peace and happiness and hope? That's the kind of strength that God has. The strength that says you can rely on him to be strong because you might not be. Frequently, when scripture talks about God's strength, it's accompanied by a call to wait on him. You don't have to be strong. God will be strong. Just be patient. Because when he shows up with his strength, it's going to be a sight to behold. And then God is our help. A refuge and a strength are, are sort of these abstract terms, but a help, that's more active. By the way, in Genesis, when Eve is described as a helper to Adam, it's this exact same term. So anything you might say about Eve and her role, you would need to say about God as well. It's not some secondary, less important kind of person. Helper is the one alongside who is incredibly vital for whatever trouble might be coming. So the first verse tells us God is a refuge and a strength and a help. Why do we need him to be those things in this psalm? Well, verses 2 and 3 tell us about what's happening. Because God is these things, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with surging, the earth is falling apart. All the stuff up here is falling down here. And the waters that should be calm and still and peaceful are frothing and raging. Chaos is reemerging. That's what's happening. This cosmic shift where God's help is needed. And then we move from this worldwide picture to a specific time and place. And the psalmist says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You read the word fortress. You might picture Martin Luther in hiding at Wartburg Castle in the 1500s, and we think of that fortress up on the high place, where if you go to hike there, at the bottom it says, it's going to be a good 30-minute hike to get to the top where this is. You're 30 minutes away from the conflict. A mighty fortress is our God, even when everything is falling apart. And at the end, the psalm invite, psalmist invites us, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We close with the repeated refrain, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What a reassuring psalm of hope in the midst of great chaos. I want you to, for a moment, just walk around the city that the psalmist imagined. Walk around this city with me. It used to be a battlefield. The smoke is still rising. Take a good whiff. You can smell the wood still burning. And you look over here, and there's some chariots that have been broken and shattered and on the ground. At your feet, there are spears that used to be deadly and now are broken in pieces. And there's shields that are smoldering because God has been at work. And if you take a listen, all the sounds of war have been replaced with the sounds of life. There's kids in the streets again, playing. The walls that used to be these fortresses to keep people out now are open, and people are moving freely in and out. This city that the psalmist imagines has been transformed, not because of the work of humans, but because of the help of God. And so everywhere you look in this city, there are just signs of a new beginning. And all those past battles are just a memory that have been replaced by this sense of calm and hope. And we know that even in the midst of chaos, as we look around, God has been at work as a help. What we want is for God to listen to us, answer just the way we've asked, and for us to then politely thank him for doing exactly what we wanted. And the people of this city would have been loved for God to just prevent all this from happening. Keep this trouble away from us. But that's not what happened. And so we, like them, we want God to go ahead of us as a fixer. Giving us a carefree life and preventing any trouble from reaching us. Or we want God to just be the cleanup where we go do all the hard work on our own, self-made people, self-reliant, and God just comes in afterwards and does the less important work. But we've learned that's not how God works. But we've also learned that God the help right beside us is exactly what we need. So when we're sitting in that doctor's office, or we're in that operating room, we really would have liked God to, kept this, to have kept this from us. I would love to not be hearing this diagnosis. I would love to not be undergoing this procedure. But God hasn't kept it from me. But God is right there beside me. And he hasn't abandoned me. And when I'm sitting in that boss's office, and he or she is telling me that there's going to have to be some changes... And that my position is being transitioned out. And whatever euphemism they want to use. I would love for God to have kept that away from me. And just fixed it. But he didn't. But when I'm sitting in that chair, in that office, God is right there beside me as a help. When I'm up at night, pacing back and forth, worried about my kids... I would love for have God to just taken away any of their abilities to make bad choices. But he hasn't done that. But when I'm up pacing at night, God is right there beside me as a help. And he's right there beside my kids. When I'm struggling with a load of depression and anxiety, and I can't even get out of bed I can't bring myself to be in crowds. I just feel my body responding. I would love for God, God to have been the fixer and just kept that away from me. But he didn't. But in the midst of my anxiety, in the midst of my depression, God is right there beside me as a helper. He has not abandoned me. When I look at society, when I look at my country in the midst of an election year, 
when I bring myself to watch maybe just a couple of minutes of a debate before I have to turn it off. I would love for God to have put some different people in front of us or fixed the issue, but he didn't. But he has not abandoned us. He is right beside us as our helper. So God might not be the fixer that we ask for, and he might not be content to play the role of just the cleanup like we'd like. But in the midst of all those things, God is still with us as our help. So as we walk through this transformed city that the psalmist imagines, we see that God the helper has been there through the battle. He did not abandon his people. He wasn't a fixer who kept the city from trouble. He wasn't a cleaner who just came in afterwards and let them take all the credit. But God was a help in the midst of turmoil. So when we find ourselves overrun, we come back to these steady words of Psalm 46 and reminded that God is our ever-present help. He is the refuge we can run to. He is our strength that sustains us. And he is our help that never fails. Now, normally, 